So let's let's talk about sure. uh, Panic 2012. Why why Panic right, 2012? Right. This was was that was that centered basically on after the first debate? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, look, th- th- there is a bit of uh, tongue in cheek nature to to the idea of panic, right? Because panic in an election where, in the end, uh, you know, o- uh, President Obama won quite handily. But in the last two months, there was uh, this 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 atmosphere of total you know panic that was. Partly media generated, partly generated by the Romney campaign, and, and partly generated by uh, you know the Obama people themselves mm-hmm. uh, freaking out, and and so the book opens uh, in in Las Vegas as they're preparing for the you know the, the what becomes the catastrophic debate in Denver, and then brings us later inside the war room in Benghazi, which is also happening in this sort of really hotly contested uh, election environment, uh, and then and then ends with you know obviously the hurricane that 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 comes in and and the entire. You know, this sort of devastating storm where everyone, of course, uh, very rightly, that's real panic. You know, you have a hurricane coming in. Um, and, and uh, you know, a- along the way, the different ways that uh, the media and, and the Obama campaign itself manipulated the, the, the fear of losing. Um, remember, you know, the Obama people love to say that they knew they were going to have it in the bag. You know, oh, we, we knew we were winning the, the, the entire way. At the same time, you were getting you and I were getting emails every day saying we're going to lose. Give us money. We're yep. going to lose. Give us money. <laughs> you know, so so they can't. They're not totally blameless in terms of um, that. There was this sort of sense of this sort of intense sense of uh, of drama uh, and, and and sort of freak out. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, the media also uh, needed to gin up a, a lot of that. But give us a sense about what sure. what was going in. I mean, you talk about um, uh, the sort of the, the 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 advice that President Obama was getting uh, going into that first debate. Sure. Um, I, I can you know I I was one of those people who felt. Um, pretty strongly as early as the beginning of this year, I guess, or last year, that President Obama was going to win. And I cannot tell you that after that first debate, I heard from, like, kids I went to school with in fourth grade just calling me out of the blue to say, like, is he going to win? What's going to happen here? I mean, that debate um, was sort of the, the drama point of the election, what what right. what what sure. was he? What was the theory going into that debate for the Obama campaign? Well, I mean, I mean, look, uh, you know, uh, my, my the sort of theory of the case that I I, I set out uh, begins in in Las Vegas, where essentially it's this very weird preparation for a debate at this, you know, a uh, bankrupt hotel. Um, can you hold, hold on, just one so second? Dog? Have a dog running around. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a sort of ba- bankrupt uh, ho- hotel in the middle of the desert. Uh, the atmosphere is 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 uh, you know completely crazy, um, you know. So so you know it, it just. Are you working uh, with that dog? From, That's not uh, Rick Scott's yeah, dog. Yeah, sorry, Reagan, yeah I, I got a puppy yesterday who's freaking out right now. Um, so I'm trying to you know manage to talk about this at the same time. Uh, make sure he doesn't destroy things. Anyway, what kind of um, dog is it? Uh, it's a corgi. <laughs> Nice little corgi puppy. All right, that's nice. Yeah, exactly. So I, I apologize for being totally unprofessional. A lot, usually, I'm in the in the car or, or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you, you, you know, look. So so it, it, it's a completely uh, it's it's completely sort of bad idea to to go out to Vegas to to do this. Um, on your part, I mean, you're the last guy I would think who would be able to deal with this. Frankly, I mean, with all due respect, I mean, just uh, you know that. Um, you don't necessarily fit the uh, the bill. I mean, you know, I, I perceive you as being um, having a slightly different attitude towards things than your average campaign um, uh, reporter. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I'm coming at it sort of from this outside perspective, right? And that's the second part of the book. So, so we, again, we, we, we open in Vegas. You know, Obama goes to Denver. He totally blows it. Uh, he, he wasn't prepared. He was given bad advice by David Axelrod. He was given bad advice by, by a, a, another uh, advisor. What was the advice um, he was given? I mean, just for, the base- he was given the, Axelrod told him to go big, to speak, you know, speak to the American people, have a conversation with the Americans, <laughs> you know, um, not, not to actually debate. I mean, essentially, that the advice actually gave was don't debate. <laughs> you know, um, to, to to paraphrase it, uh, and and he didn't, and he was caught totally flat-footed. P- plus, I think you know he'd gotten you know as everybody said he'd gotten you know content with with being pr- with being uh, president. You know, he he was 
uh, not used to being questioned like that. But anyway, uh, after that, everybody, you know, you said you got calls from all your friends. Everybody freaked out. You know, uh, the advisors to Obama were getting Tony Robbins called to offer advice. Tony Robbins, um, the, uh, the Tony guy. Tony Robbins, this, the self-help guru, called to say, like, I, I need to be part of the debate prep team. <laughs> you know, I can help you guys win, you know. Um, so, so, wow. so it was a complete uh, freak out across uh, the board. Did they and, wait? And, and, did they did they accept did, it? I mean, did it did, did Tony I, Robbins? I, I don't think so. I think they were telling everybody to uh, to to uh, you know chill, chill out, out, and and then they got it. Um, but it was a pretty you know at the uh, at the end of it um, at the end of the debate uh, session, you know, Obama went back to to the White House eventually, and, and they and they really sat down and you know what did he do wrong? And he said, and according to sources I've talked to, he took responsibility, but also said, you know, you guys gave me some pretty bad advice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, in some yeah. ways, I mean, that notion of, of staying above the fray uh, and not engaging in sort of like the, the sort of the, I guess, the, 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 the hand-to-hand wrestling in some respects was sort of not inconsistent with a, a lot of the way that um, he had been uh, dealing with the Republicans back in 2010 and 2011. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. I mean, it was sort of a classic... You know, classic uh, Obama moment. Moment, um, and and you know, so, so that's that's one narrative of the debate. The the other the one narrative of the story. The other is as as we discussed, as we sort of started to talk about. You know, I'm coming into this scene. Uh, I'm an outsider. I'm not part of the White House press corps. I'm not part of the traveling campaign press. Um, and and I'm kind of observing them. All you know, reporting on them, it's pretty uncomfortable. But they they sort of take me in as uh, I call it the Mean Girls effect, where you know, and of course I'm portraying myself as a Lindsay Lohan in this scenario, where I, you know I show up. There's sort of this interest, and then at the uh, and then you know we become kind of friendly. I start to kind of like them, and then eventually I end up clashing with the the White House uh, and the White House uh, press corps over a story uh, I wrote. Uh, with a, there was a couple weeks left in the campaign, I wrote a story. They got so upset about this story that they threatened to throw me off the campaign plane. Yeah. Now tell um, this is because you you basically uh, you reported on something that was supposedly off the record. Is that what it was? Well, they always. This is what they always say. It's it's crazy. Um, so the, the exact details are uh, at the end of uh, beginning of September after the DNC, Obama went down to Florida uh, for a campaign tour. Uh, we got this email. Uh, one of the nights, I said, "Hey, senior staff are going to have drinks with reporters at an off-the-record session." You know, so everybody's pretty. You know, okay, cool. And then, as 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 the, as this, you know, drinks got closer, we started to hear whispers. Oh, Obama himself is going to show up, which he's never. He never does. He 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 really never never really does. Um, in fact, he he the last time he he'd spent time with the campaign press like that apparently was four years ago. Uh, so it, it's a rare event. Uh, and, and he came down, and, and he did his thing and talked to everybody and spent about an hour there, uh, you know, kind of knocking back beers with reporters. Totally fine, right? Like, not a big deal. No one reported what he said or what was said there. Uh, but, but about a month after that happened, I just mentioned, oh, yeah, you know, Obama went down and did this, which actually is following the White House's own policy of these things. Uh, because you're always supposed to note when there is an off-the-record session. You just don't say what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So I just mentioned it in a story, uh, and, and all hell broke loose. You know, I got you know, lectured by a Fox News correspondent, and Ed Henry, the guy's name was, and, uh, <laughs> you know. What did, and, he, what and, did and Ed he, Henry have to tell you about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Ed, 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 Ed told me that I needed to start pretending that that, uh, actual meeting with Obama never even existed. That if I was ever asked about it, I would have to pretend it did not exist. Um, and then he said the other problem was is that it, it it you know made everybody look bad because I reported it and other people didn't. Made right. Everyone look bad. So in <laughs> other words, what it was is that even though the policy is that we should report that we're having off the record meetings with uh, the president, where he is <laughs> supposedly developing relationships, right, with the reporters. That's what yeah, this is exactly, about. Exactly. Uh, by and you telling <laughs> telling their readers that they did this and them not telling it, they hurt. It hurts their credibility with their readers, theoretically. Yeah, exactly. No, no. The funny thing is, of course, no one, no one outside of Ed Henry, myself, and the other eighteen people on the bus even care. Right. Well, that's the other thing. Other. Is that there's no group of Fox uh, viewers out there going like, Ed Henry never told us about this. I mean, <laughs> yeah, nobody no, is. Right. You know. 
Well, it's just so, a, so that was the funny thing. It was I, I even I think at one point in the book I say, "Oh my God, the stakes are so so incredibly low here that we're fighting <laughs> yes. over." Yes. Um, but is that but, also but, a yeah, function was, of how much of a bubble those people live in? Like you know, like they think that that's a big story that somehow I mean, it it, 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 it means that the the audience for that to be a scandal is so small. Uh, it, it's really just sort of everybody just winking at each other in the room saying like, look, we all know, but we all have to pretend in some respects, right? I mean, because he couldn't right. possibly be thinking this is going to hurt my credibility with, with people who read my stuff on foxnews.com or something, right? I mean, he's talking about this is going to hurt my credibility with the other 25 people who were there too, that we all are part of this sort of group where we all sort of agree that like, we're going to pretend to have this credibility. Yeah, yeah. No, ex- ex- exactly. Um, and, and, and I think, I mean, the, the funny thing at the, at the, uh, at the, at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of, of this sort of speech that, that Ed Henry gave me, he said, well, you know, from now on you're going to be dealing with the White House because they're the ones who are going to punish you, basically. I, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, you know, the White House is going to punish you for doing this. And so, sure enough, the White House, you know, calls up my editor and screams at them. So oh, hey, you know, hey, things this and that, um, and 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 we and, and literally, my editor was like, are, are 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 we really having this conversation? Like, are you guys, are you guys high? Um, and but but it was not it, at the end of the day, it didn't matter that it was completely insignificant that this, you know, that Obama went down and hung out with reporters for a little bit. It was just about controlling the message and making sure that there was an obedient White House press corps. Mm-hmm. Um, that followed the rules of, of a certain number of, of senior officials who, who kind of, uh, you know, guide and shape the coverage. So, so it, was a, it was about control. It wasn't about, you know, oh my, you know, it wasn't about the sensitivity of the information. Um, and, and there's also, also something to, to consider that the White House believes that just by allowing us to hang out with President Obama for an hour, our coverage will be more positive. That's that's that, that's that's interesting that they think that, and it might be true. So, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I, that's what I was going to ask you is not so much in terms of the the White House because I think to a certain extent it is definitely true, and and I and I wonder if even your uh, the fact that these that the your fellow correspondents took you in, um, uh, in you know, in some respects if that doesn't in any way shape your coverage of them. I mean, I think, like, there's a certain inevitability. There was uh, Lexi Sales, this uh, comedian out of this uh, crew of comedians in the 1980s in Britain, always had a saying about, um, you know, the problem with all his friends getting famous, those guys like, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Rowan Atkinson, et cetera, that they, they become friends with Phil Collins, and then you can't talk about how bad his music is anymore. Um, <laughs> That that oh, there's some of that that happens, yes. Oh, oh, for sure. I mean, look, I came into. I mean, I came in thinking, oh, I was going to hate these guys, and and you know, wasn't going to like it, and thought they were going to be all hacks. That's actually not. After spending time with them, I actually had a much more nuanced view. It may not get reflected in in the coverage of the book, but but I, I found I found these guys. You know, a lot of them to be actually. You know, I, I mean, this sounds even condescending saying this, but you know, they're obviously extremely talented, great, great journalists. There, they're also really horrible journalists. There, um, and even the portrait of Ed Henry, at least as I tried, it was it was trying to get. You know, let's Ed hear the Henry, list. Who, who, you know, who, who's who on which side it's of the... not, It's not a. <laughs> it's not just like oh, a savaging of of Ed Henry. It's, right. You know, I, I think uh, a pretty you know, uh, more complicated picture of the guy where he's this sort of. Uh, Kind of good, you know, nice, nice guy, fun to be around, really good with people, uh, but but also plays this kind of, you know, Washington insider game in a way that that is is, is problematic. Right, and um, I mean that on some level it seems to me to be indicative of a lot of uh, of the press corps, right? I mean, you yeah. you're not going to succeed in that uh, venue if you are a prickly um, uh, type of person. I mean, if you, you're right, I mean, you have to be congenial and uh, likable on some level, but at the end of the day, that's not really, at the end of the day, that's not really what you should be judged upon in terms of your role as a reporter. No, exactly. And I think, like, you know, uh, often, too, um, when, when you're sort of dealing with these, there is a, a legitimate argument that, the, the White House guys will make for this. The, the act, which is, that, look, we, the reason we do these things and agree to these onerous conditions 
is because we need to get close to these people because it helps our reporting and it helps us understand our reporting. The drawback is, well, and this is a conversation I've had multiple times, if all the best stuff we know and we learn, we're not allowed to say, <laughs> we're not allowed to report, and in fact we kind of just keep secret among ourselves and our editors, then how is that helping our reporting? And then, then, then you know, you're not helping your reporting, you're just pulling punches. You know, you're just getting uh, co-opted. I mean, this is the, this is the, I think, the sort of the, 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 the central dilemma that exists in the context of our media today. Maybe it's always been there, but uh, the uh, balancing that platform and access uh, versus actually why, why you're there in the first place. Right, right. No, no, I think, I think that's right. I think, uh, I, I, and look, it, it's not, you know, I got into this screaming match with a reporter from the Wall Street Journal once on the plane. Um, shockingly, you know, not getting along with everybody. Uh, and I got in a couple of screaming matches. One, I was fucking dead drunk and don't recall the exact wording, but it wasn't kind. And this next one on the plane, um, we had actually this sort of fairly interesting debate uh, that quickly degenerated into insults, but uh, over over this idea of quote approval. Um, and I was saying, you know, I was not a fan of it, and immediately I was, you know, criticized. You know, she, she, this, this Wall Street reporter kind of launched into me. And at the end of the day, after I said, oh, why don't you go hack a phone with Rupert Murdoch, uh, we did come to this agree to disagree, um, uh, you know, understanding, uh, which was that, you know, she, 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 we just had such radically different ideas of what it meant to be a reporter, you know? But her, it's also, was, well, let, you're, you're representing a major threat to them, too, I would assume. I and mean, it's like, uh, you know, uh, I, can't, I keep bringing up uh, sort of like uh, movies from the 70s, but, you know, that was a big thing in Serpico, right? If you don't take the money, uh, for, uh, the money that we get paid, nobody's going to trust you there. So, I mean, if you somehow buck that, um, that, uh, that rule by the administration, you're threatening really all the other reporters in some respects. Oh, for sure. And, and you would be shocked how many reporters came up to me throughout the, throughout the campaign and, and, and just sort of, like, terrified, like, you're not going to write about what I say and do, are you? I'm like, well, you know, maybe, <laughs> you know. It's like, oh, my God, how can you do that? It's like, well, you know, look, we're, we're with campaign reporting, with political reporting, you're part of the story because we generate the story. We make the story. We shape the narrative. Therefore, uh, you know, our behavior as, as members of the press should be, should be subject to, to pretty intense uh, scrutiny. Do you uh, when when you're when you're retelling uh, that type of thing? Do you, uh, in terms of your own code? I mean, for instance, uh, is it as newsworthy that um, boy uh, that dude goes up to the buffet way too many times, and everybody's bummed <laughs> that you know if you're behind him in line, you're not going to get any of the the cantaloupe <laughs> or whatever it is, um, or is it is it, you know will you just specifically stick to? the dynamic that they have that ultimately informs their reporting? Or um, is it fair game to say, th- you know, that guy has the worst sort of, he never washed his hands he, when he left the bathroom? He never washed his hands. Yeah, I usually, I probably wouldn't put in someone's name if I was going to make that observation. Um, but, but look, I try, like, look, the reason I mentioned, you know, I think I only really write about one journalist by name, and that's, that's uh, Ed Henry. And that's because, look, he's the head of the White House Correspondence Association. He, he's a public figure. He worked for CNN. Now he's at, at Fox News. Um, and, and so he, in that role, he is more of a public figure right. than just like Joe, Joe uh, Beat Reporter, you know, who's, who's uh, you know, just trying to, you know, pay the bills and, and do their thing. Um, so, so I, you know, I think, look, you, you want to be, I always try also, whoever I am uh, sort of writing about, and if, especially if I'm doing it in a way that people might consider somewhat more critical to, 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 to be, you know, not just pick it. I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, you know? And if I am, if I am kind of, say, writing at length about Jay Carney, well, he's the White House press secretary, and these guys, these guys are big boys, and they can punch back, right. <laughs> you know, and they do, and they will. Um, so so I, I try to play with it, you know, try to write with a sense of sort of fairness about, uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, look, one could easily, you, you see, you don't want, you could go around and write about, you know, oh, destroy some, you know, low-ranking Obama official, you know, really, you know, kick their... But what's the point of that? There's no point, and, and they're in it, too, in the sort of same way. Um, but if you look at, actually, but that's not necessarily the philosophy that a lot of political reporting operates on. I mean, you know, uh, Politico, uh, the venerable 
media website, uh, mm-hmm. political website, uh, you, you know, they their biggest, you know, quote unquote, you know, takedown was of like, like a 27 year old, uh, you know, uh, spokesperson for for Representative Daryl Issa. You know, th- those are the guys. They'll really kill those guys. You know, they'll they'll, they'll they'll give you know they'll flood the zone and you know destroy their careers. Um, you know, people who are essentially you know, helpless and, and, and we're right. in no position to, to actually, there's no, the, yeah. I mean, that's just like a sacrificial lamb. Uh, you're yeah. not threatening any of the power structure there. Uh, but you're still making it look like, uh, you are non-sentimental, I guess. Yeah. And then, so I guess that's my, that's just my large, whenever I'm trying to do this, I try to like, pr- you know, protect, you know, protect the, the innocent, so to speak, or at least the people who you, you should always, I think, be, be looking at the people in power, the people who have real influence, those are the people I think worthy of 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 uh, giving them the you know the a close look and again doesn't right not, and uh, mean, then doesn't otherwise you're just TMZ positive. at that point I mean maybe yeah. not even like uh, I don't I don't mean to knock TMZ I don't I have no idea but they may <laughs> they may have an internal set of code of ethics that I I don't know I don't want I don't but I'm just <laughs> using that as an example um, I don't want to get the TMZ people pissed at me. Yeah, I know they're, they're going to be waiting outside your waiting. Every, and next thing you have, you go through security at LAX, they'll be there. That's right. I'm going to have to dress a little more appropriately. Well, uh, <laughs> Michael, it's uh, great stuff. Panic 2012: uh, uh, the sublime and terrifying inside story of Obama's final campaign. Uh, it's uh, available at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it, it's 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 available right now in ebook only. Um, but you can get it on your Kindle, your Nook, or or iPad. And uh, I'm pushing to get get paper copies, but if if your listeners, if you guys want to read it, please do. Appreciate all the support. Uh, every every sale re- really actually does make a make a big difference. Um, and it just came out today, so a lot of good stuff, a lot of fun. It's entertaining. It's quick read. People describe it as as reading something like you've just taken Adderall. So uh, fantastic. I took that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll put a link up to it uh, on our site uh, at majority.fm. Thanks for coming by and uh, talking to us. 